At last, let's continue our discussion of digestive system diseases as we focus and shift gear from viruses and bacteria to the helminthes. Our helminthes, or parasitic worms, can cause a wide variety of infections within human beings. And there's a lot of variety within the parasitic worm or helminthes category. These can be very small round worms that are approximately 0.3 millimeters long, or these can be enormously long tapeworms that could be 25 meters in length. So there's a lot of variety within the size of these parasites. There are three primary categories of helminthes that we'll focus on. They are the nematodes, the trematodes, and the cestodes, the round worms, the flukes, and the tapeworms. All these parasitic worms, these helminthes diseases, are going to be accompanied by an additional set of symptoms that are going to be a complication and arise from the host response to that worm being within our bodies. One of which is eosinophilia. We're going to have a lot of eosinophils. These are eosinophils are a granular leukocyte, and this granular leukocyte is specialized for destroying helminthes. They are the white blood cell that specializes in destroying parasitic worms in our bodies. And having lots of eosinophils or an elevated eosinophil count in the blood is the key characteristic or hallmark of a helminthic infection. Helminthes are typically going to be transmitted through the fecal oral route. Occasionally they'll penetrate the skin, but fecal oral route is by far the most common mode of transmission of the helminthic infections. These organisms, these helminthes, are going to spend part of their lives within our intestinal tract, within the human intestinal tract. And while they are in the intestines, the hu helminthes can run the gamut of intestinal symptoms. So you can have your malaise, your nausea, your irritation. There's lots of intestinal symptoms that can be associated with a helminthic infection. Sometimes we're also going to have symptoms that are produced outside of the intestines as well, but ma the majority of the symptoms will be isolated around intestinal organs. And there's four different ways that helminthes can manifest their life cycles, life cycles that get transmitted to human beings. We have cycle A. During cycle A, a human ingests a mature egg. The egg releases the larva, and then the larva grow up in the intestinal tract and then re the human will expel embryonic eggs that mature and then we have a human only cycle here where the human ingests the egg and then the human releases the egg. We also could have cycle B. Within cycle B our worms are going to mature inside of our intestinal tract and then we will have an egg released and then we'll have the larval state of the worm migrate back into the human being and then re-enter the intestinal tract and mature and form more eggs. With cycle C, this is going to involve a secondary host or secondary carrier. We typically are going to, as humans, expel the eggs. The eggs will be ingested by the secondary carrier. The secondary carrier will have the eggs hatch within their tissue. We consume the infected tissue and then redevelop the infection. And then we have cycle D. Cycle D is going to involve the infection of infect or the consumption of infected animal flesh, and then we are going to expel eggs. Those eggs hatch, and then there will be a secondary larval stage, and that secondary larval stage can either direct, re directly enter the human or directly enter the animal that the human eats, so that the human can become reinfected. So, there are a lot of different ways that we can mix and match the helminthic life cy cycles. Sometimes the eggs mature in the human, sometimes the eggs are going to be only produced in the human and then mature outside of the human. Sometimes they involve a secondary host carrying the disease, the pathogen. The two classic types of infections that we are going to talk about in detail are going to be the Enterobias vermiculonis and the Taulina soleum infections. Disease tables are going to be provided for several more helminthic diseases, but for the purposes of your exams and the purposes of this class, these are the two helminthic diseases I want you to focus on. I'm not going to test you on any of the other helminthic diseases of the digestive tract. These helminthes are going to have a lot of virulence factors that are quite sophisticated. As multicellular organisms, helminthes are quite complicated and are going to be more difficult to expel from our bodies than the single cellular organisms that are typically infected with. These helminthes have numerous adaptations to help them survive within the host. They are going to have specialized mouth parts that allow for those, those organisms to attach to our 
tissues of the digestive tract to feed. These helminthes are going to have enzymes that allow them to liquefy and penetrate tissues of our body to more easily move through our body. And they are also going to have a covering on their body that helps protect them from our host defenses, from those eosinophils that we use to mount a defense. We also are going to ha find that helminthes have specialized organ structures. These helminthes live in the digestive tract. So they're really focused on getting food and processing the food, movement and reproducing. They don't necessarily need to have a complicated nervous system. They don't need to necessarily have a respiratory system per se. They just focus on consuming the food that they're surrounded with and then reproducing. A lot of the damage that's caused by the helminthes is going to be in response by triggering an inappropriate immune response within the host. We can find that there's the definite and intermediate hosts. The definite host is the host that the adult worm is always going to be found. Humans oftentimes have become accidental definitive hosts for helminthes who typically are going to focus on cows and pigs and fish. And that's typically because we start to eat the cows, the pigs, the fish and ingest the helminthes associated with them. Intermediate hosts are hosts that are only going to have the larval stage of the helminthes in them. And humans have our native intermediate hosts for several species of helminthes. Oh. Generally speaking, regardless of what kind of helminthe and helminthic infection is occurring, there is always going to be the same series of steps to diagnose that infection. First, a blood sample is drawn, and then it's stained, and then examined to see the, how many eosinophils are present. So we're going to test to see if eosin philia is present in the patient. We're also going to perform some serological exams. These serological exams are going to indicate whether or not the patient is producing um, antibodies for helminthic antigens. So we'll expose their blood to antigens associated with the helminthe, and if there's clotting, that means the patient is making, actively making antibodies against that helminthe antigen. We also are going to do talk to the patient about their history. Have they traveled or immigrated from a tropical area or an area that has a high prevalence or high concentration of helminthic infections? And then we're also going to look for definitive evidence as well. Earl, this er, general diagnosis can be circumstantial, but the definitive diagnosis is going to be finding eggs, larvae, or war adult worms in the patient or something associated with the patient, like the patient's stools. Worms are typically going to be distinct in morphology so that we can identify them based off of their growth during any stage, including the eggs. So these worms are going to be very unique looking from each other. All helminthic worms do not look the same. They all look different from each other. Typically, not all diseases are going to result from eggs or larval stages that can be re readily found in the stool. And instead, we're going to maybe potentially find some adult worms in the stool. Unfortunately, there are no vaccines for helminthic-based infections um, for the particular infections that we're going to focus on in this presentation or in this chapter. There are some preventative measures, though, that can help minimize our contact with these helminthes and or interrupt the life cycle of these helminthes. Some of the anti-helminthic medications that we have focus on the cellular physiology, physiology of eukaryotic parasites that resemble that of humans. A downside of those medications, though, is that they typically are going to focus on the eukaryotic cell. And since both helminths and humans are eukaryotic organisms, medications that affect the helminthe are typically going to affect the human as well. So there'll be lots of nasty side effects associated with treatment um, of a helminthic infection. Cellular anti-helminthic drugs are going to suppress metabolic processes that are more important to our worm than to the human. So they still will affect the human being, but we don't necessarily need that physiological process as much as the worm does. Other anti-helminthic drugs are going to focus on inhibiting movement of the worm and make it so the worm can, um, and it will make it so the worm cannot maintain its position within a certain organ. And if we're looking in the digestive tract, this is very important. The worm can move and actively through the digestive tract to keep from being flushed out of the digestive tract. If the worm can ceases from moving, the worm will likely be flushed from the digestive tract. Some helminths have developed resistance to the drugs that we used to treat them, unfortunately, and in extreme cases, we may, we may need to perform surgery to remove the worms or larvae from the patients. One highlight disease that we're going to focus on is the intestinal distress 
as uh, helminthic disease that forms intestinal distress as the primary symptoms. This can be from a tapeworm or a roundworm. We also get find that the nematome, entero, enterobias vermiculitis, or, or our tapeworm, tinea soleum, are going to be two uh, helminthes that can do this. So let's go and talk in detail about these two specific species of tapeworms. Or excuse me, helminthes, and <laughs> those two specific species of helminthes. So first we have Enterobias vermicularis. This is sometimes referred to as a pinworm or the seat worm. Most commonly in the Midwest you hear the term pinworm used. Occasionally you'll hear individuals say the term seat worm, but pinworm is the most common one in the Midwest. This is an infection of children commonly with that live in temperate zones. The transmission cycle is type A transmission cycle, so we are going to find that freshly deposited eggs will have of this worm will be have a sticky coating that allows them to get lodged onto the fingers of humans, and then those eggs can dry and become airborne and settle in house dust. Eventually, though, whether from the fingers or from the dust, those eggs are going to be ingested in the human. They'll hatch in the small intestine and release larvae that migrate to the large intestine. And from there, in the large intestine, the larvae mature into adult worms and start to mate. The hallmark symptom of an infection with pinworm or seat worm is that there's going to be some itching around the anus of the infected patient. This itching occurs as the female worm is emerging from the anal opening and lays eggs around the anus of the infected patient. These infections are not fatal and they're in many cases going to be asymptomatic for the patient so there will be no symptoms being exhibited. Generally speaking, children that are going to be infected could experience disrupted sleep patterns, nausea, abdominal discomfort, and diarrhea, some general discomfort associated with the infection of their bodies. It's also possible to diagnose this test or diagnose this infection using a rapid test. This is, rapid test is performed by pressing a piece of adhesive tape against the anal opening and then applying it to a slide for microscopic examination. In essence, the tape is put on the anal opening pick up any eggs and then you look at the tape underneath a microscope to see if you can find any eggs. If one person in the family has been diagnosed with this helminth, generally speaking the entire family should receive treatment because it can spread so readily with, within an entire family unit. So we talked about pinworm, enterobias vermicularis, this pinworm has a cycle A, where it's going to be transmitted um, with the oral fecal route. This tape, tapeworm, excuse me, this pinworm can be prevented with good oral hygiene and good hand washing techniques. It's very common within the United States. To treat it, we prescribe two general anti-helminthic drugs. And this pinworm has a higher prevalence rate in the southern United States as opposed to the northern United States. These other worms, the whipworm, the fish tapeworm, and then this category over here, these are helminthic infections I am not going to test you on and I am not going to hold you accountable on for the test. So even though they are in your textbook, we are not going to focus on them. There's also some intestinal distress that can be accounted by some migratory symptoms of the helminths as the helminths are moving through the intestinal tract. So if we look at helminths, they're very diverse. These helminths can have their enter as a, an entire body or as a larva or as an egg form. So they can enter our body um, in multiple fashions. They can be the larval as they, a larva as they enter our body or an egg as they enter our body. They're going to mature though to become an adult with or a mature stage in our human intestines and from our intestines they can start to migrate through our circulatory system and our lymphatic systems. They can travel to the heart, to the lungs and other organs of our body and can move through a respiratory tree if and then become swallowed. Once they're swallowed they can then return to the intestinal tract where they can take up residence. So this is a particularly nasty life cycle where they start in the intestines, move through several body organs, and then go back to the intestines. 
As these helminths are moving through our bodies, obviously there's going to be some symptoms associated with them penetrating and perforating all of those tissues. All conditions produce symptoms in the digestive tract, some inflammatory reactions along the route of migration. There'll be an increase in the eosinophil, so eosinophilia, and then during the lung stage, there's also going to be associated pneumonia with these helminthy infections. One particular helminth that we should focus on is cysterosis, or, and that particular helminth is known as Tallinia solinium, aka the tapeworm. Adult tapeworms are typically five meters in length. They can be longer, they can be shorter. They have a scolex. You can think of the scolex as kind of the mouth of the tapeworm. And the scolex has a bunch of hooklets and sucklers, suckers that, that are used to anchor this tapeworm into our intestinal tract. This has a transmission cycle C. So humans become infected by eating infected animal flesh that contains the worms themselves. The pig tapeworm has been distributed worldwide. It's concentrated in areas, though, where humans have close proximity to pigs or where we have bad food hygiene where we eat undercooked pork on a regular basis. In the United States, most people are rather paranoid about cooking their pork, so that's not something we necessarily need to worry about. And we don't necessarily live in close proximity to pigs in the United States. But it is still endemic within the United States. Here we can see the scolex of a tapeworm. The scolex has both the hooks and the suckers that are used for anchoring. And here we can see a fully coiled tapeworm. They can be quite long, and to give you a size of scale, from one side to the other side of this coil is two feet. So this tapeworm is multiple feet long. If we look at cysterioscosis within pigs, those worms will hatch in the small intestine. The larvae that are released from the small intestine will migrate throughout the organs of the pig and eventually insist themselves within the muscle tissue of the pig. Cysterii are very young tapeworm that are infective for humans. So once those tapeworms have encapsulated themselves and assist within the muscle tissue of the pig, we've recategorized them as a cysterii, and those cysterii are capable of infecting human beings when we ingest undercooked pork. After ingesting the undercooked pork, that tapeworm is then going to be flushed into our intestinal tract and it will attach to our, the wall of our intestine using its scolex with those hooks and suckers and it will eventually develop into the adult tapeworm. When we ingest the tapeworm eggs of another form of T. scolinium, our infection will also incur. This is going to be one of the five neglected parasitic infections of the United States or NPI stands for Neglected Parasitic Infection. It's estimated that we have approximately tens of thousands of Latinos in the United States that are currently infected by this disease. It's not recognized though because US physicians, generally speaking, don't know to look for it. We can also have neurocysterosis, and this occurs when the larvae will insist themselves within the brain. So the tapeworm larvae embed themselves in the human brain. And it's estimated that approximately 10% of seizures in the United States, or in some U.S. cities, are related to tapeworm larvae forming cysts in human brains. And that's all we have for this section. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to post them to the discussion board or shoot me an email. Happy studies!